I wish to encourage the young people in Kenya that keep the struggle high. And as you are doing that, start thinking. Start thinking and combine the indigenous governance systems with a bit of the educated technological system. Find out for yourself a hybrid form of governance. You will have failed to push out Ruto from the office and then push another president, another prime minister into the same office who will be implementing the same laws, the same governance structures. The same Roman Dutch law that I've been preaching for the longest of time. That law is useless. It is misplaced. You cannot run Roman Dutch law in Africa. We are not Romans and we are not Dutch. We need to start putting that between our ears. But uh, what we see happening in, in, in Kenya is not just a drop in the bucket. It is um, a surgeons. It's a new energy that is coming on to the platform where the young people are beginning to challenge the system. The only problem that we have, if it is a problem and a solution, is that when we fight these governments, when we remove them from power, what do we replace them with? Uh, the problem or the danger or this, the disadvantage would be to change hyenas with foxes. You remove one leader from power and then you put another leader in the same democratic system. Long, young people, ladies and gentlemen, until we fully come to comprehension that the colonial democratic system will not work. Learn from Britain. Democracy will not work. Learn from United Arab Emirates. Democracy will not work. Learn from the Arab states. Democracy will not work. Learn from Singapore. Learn from China. Learn from North Korea. We needed to go back to find those indigenous governance systems. Call your elders in your cities, in your provinces, in your countries. Call your traditional elders together. Include women and include young people. Let them be a council that is above the government. The government must report to the people. The government must not be accountable to itself. The government must be accountable to the people. And the people must supervise the political system. Because this model of having minority in terms of parliamentarians ruling and governing the majority cannot work. A more representative form of governance as we used to have it in the olden days where the elders would sit together, women would sit Young people would sit, rites of passages would be put in place, and as we have already mentioned in another production that we did, all governments, all governments are illegitimate. All governments are illegitimate because they are collecting taxes on the land that does not belong to them. All African governments that have gone into power, they've gone into power and they've made themselves the kings of those land and they are collecting taxes on a land that does not belong to them. In fact, we went to war to fight for the land, not to fight for democracy. We went to fight for the land. But unfortunately, the land and the system of indigenous governance systems was never returned. And the kings and the owners of the land were never given the land. Now the kings are actually paying taxes on their own land. When these businesses must be paying rent and taxes to the local indigenous leaders. Boom! And the best of them all was Orania in South Africa. Orania, there is a country in South Africa uh, called Orania where the Africaners, the white Africaners, have decided to create their own city, their own town, their own flag, their own currency and govern themselves. Why? They are preserving themselves, self-determination. They want to rule themselves. Blacks are not allowed to live there. Blacks are not allowed to work there. And this has become an exclusive place where only Africaners can live because they feel threatened that their culture is being eroded by the democracy. So if the Africaners are allowed to have their own country in a country, are allowed to run their own self-determination program in a country. The question is, why must the Zulus not also be self-determining? 
Why must the Sutus, the vendors, the Tongas, the, the, the Tuanas uh, also not do the same? Why must the African constantly be told of this concept of collective government, but the collective government is only benefiting a few? As such, the resources that are in the country need to be distributed fairly. And this comes to one of the statuses that I had put, and I think some four years ago, the issue of decentralizing capital cities. Decentralizing capital cities. And the educated Africans, who when they look at me, they say, hey, my ponga is going mad, my ponga is going crazy. Don't worry, you will wake up one day. Time is with you, don't worry. The more you study, the more you grow. You may just find that there is some sanity in my madness. Those that have made it in this world have found their own cultural vortex, their own cultural roots. They found their purpose and reason for being. They found their identity. They found their culture. Look at China. Close out Facebook. Close out TikTok. Close out all these other things. Be selfish with the minds of your young people. Feed them with the information that will develop them to own, to respect, to be innovative, and to develop their own countries. And until we begin to combine the knowledge that we now have with the history that we are coming from, to come up with a hybrid sort of system that will take us out of this confusion and maze of neo-colonialism, we will constantly be talking that things are not changing. Yet things will not change until you and I change the way we think. Because we think that the white people have solutions for black people. It can't be that the very same people who abused us can come around and now they have a solution for us. They're not interested in Africa. They're interested in the resources of Africa. And these resources must be beneficiated on the ground. And when they beneficiate them, where are they taking those resources to? Well, we need therefore to start understanding that the movement that we are now having, the rising up and the saging of the African spirits, it's almost like our ancestors are coming back alive and well. Alive and well. And we're going to be starting up a movement in Zimbabwe in the next few weeks for the... Because by expanding capital cities, you are putting the burden of the entire country on a city. These cities were not built to be lived by millions of Africans. They were built for a few white people and a few servants. So now when you have one, three, four million people sitting around the infrastructure of a city like Bulwe or a city like Harare, the water becomes a problem, electricity becomes a problem, roads become a problem, hospitals become a problem. It is not that the services are poor, but they are overburdened. So here is my free advice to Honorable E.D. Mnangagwa. Take the Department of Tourism, the Department of Tourism, the whole office, move it from Harare to Victoria Falls. Let Victoria Falls have the Minister of Tourism at the place where tourism is happening. That will move away most of the tourism directors, their families, their children and everything. Huck, Victoria Falls. Move the Department of Economics, Business, Economic Affairs. Move it to Bulueo. Because strategically speaking, Bulueo is a junction. Good transport, infrastructure, railway lines, and proximity to Botswana, proximity to South Africa, proximity to Namibia, proximity to, to Zambia. And Bulueo can actually become the financial hub, financial hub of Zimbabwe. Move then agriculture. Say to Mutare, the whole Department of Agriculture, move to Mutare. The Department of Education, move it to Gweru. Department of Mining and etc. Maybe move it to Kwekwe and etc. And then Department of um, you know, Research and uh, you know, move it to Chiredzi or somewhere there. You, you begin to see that when you move the departments away from the capital city, you are able to release the pressure on the city. And then you can leave Yarare as the capital city of your legal structures and parliament and etc. But then you, you'll be able to distress the, 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 the infrastructure itself by moving these departments away. South Africa, Durban is for tourism, for example. And uh, Cape Town is where the parliament is happening. But Bloemfontein is uh, the judiciary capital. And Pretoria 
remains a state house and etc. By so doing, we are able to spread out, spread out the resources of the country to the specific areas. The universities that are in these areas in Bulueyo, then you have your university that specializes in finance in Victoria Falls, universities that specialize in, uh, in, uh, in uh, hospitality, and then the where the, the, do the education, the mining, the technologies, the mutare, and, and, and you, you just, you, you release the pressure, release the pressure, spread the cake, rather than collecting money from the whole country and feeding it into Harare. And at the end of the day, everyone, everyone begins to run to the capital city. The quicker we begin to spread these resources across the whole country, be it Botswana, be it Zambia, be it Zimbabwe, be it Malawi, avoid the capital city mentality. Because then you leave other parts of the country in a worse state, yet they're also contributing to the GDP. As such, it will be critical that when we want to deal with infrastructure development, we need to spread the infrastructure resources within the entire city, entire country, entire continent. And by so doing, I think we'll have been able to, to harness the energy of the young people to develop themselves where they are, to develop themselves where they are. And then you don't need to be running to Harare or running to Bulawayo because wherever you are, there is sufficient infrastructure that can actually help to develop. Then whoever the minister is of that department, where they are, with the chiefs that are there, set up a council there, then the council that reports maybe to the, to the higher government that is wherever, or the council of the elders. Then decentralize. We need to come up with a strategy to rework the model of leadership within Africa. We cannot have leaders who are being bribed by the West, bribed by the East, bribed by the North, and they come around here and they implement the principles of their colonial masters. They implement, they implement the principles of their handlers. And what do we end up having? We end up having stooges. Stooges that act like presidents and prime ministers. Meanwhile, they are taking instructions from the other powers that be. The young people of today are no longer as naive to be dealt with as if they are stupid. They are learned. They have studied. They have world trends. And they may have an understanding exactly as to what is happening in other countries. And we must also remember, while we are doing that, we must preserve ourselves as Africans. We must preserve ourselves. If we are in a hurry to get into the global village, and yet we lack the moral, ethical, African Ubuntu fiber, we we'll still end up again as slaves in the very global market in which we are rushing to. With those few words, 